Hello again doctors and welcome back to my channel. In this video I will be going over the opportunistic fungi that are tested on USMLE Step 1. This includes the microbiology, pathology, applicable immunology, and pharmacology. It's going to be in the same format as my deep fungal video which I will have linked at the end. I will list my sources down below as well as timestamps to where the information for the individual fungi begins. So without further ado, grab some coffee, get comfortable, and let's expose these opportunists. As always, we start off with their names, starting with Aspergillus, Fumigatus, and Flavus, Mucor and Rhizophus, which are our bread molds, Pneumocystis vecchiae, who has an inherent resistance to antifungals, Candida albicans, who's our big exception, and finally Cryptococcus neoformans. The mnemonic I used to remember them in that order is all moms potentially can cry. Now let's go over what they all have in common. They are all ubiquitous saprophytes. They all have nonspecific epidemiology and are found worldwide. They all have a tropism for specific tissues that they like to infect. They are all inhaled and primarily cause respiratory symptoms except candida. And of course, these are opportunists, so they have invasive forms and they only afflict the immune compromised with HIV AIDS being the main risk factor. The ones I have colored in, in red are AIDS defining illnesses. And finally, all can be treated with the azoles or amphotericin except Girovecchiae. First up is Aspergillus. Now he was discovered in 1729 by an Italian botanist who likened him to an Aspergillum under microscopy. Now an Aspergillum is that thing that priests use to sprinkle holy water over the pews, so that's where he got his name from. In terms of the etiology, it's one of the most abundant fungi found. It's widespread worldwide. It's used commercially for the production of things like sake, and everyone is exposed. He actually loves to live in our pillows. His route of entry is through inhalation of the conidiophores, and there are two species we need to be aware of. The first one being A. flavus, which is associated with aflatoxin, so they share the same first four letters. It's heavily associated with peanuts and crops, giving farmers the occupational hazard here. Most importantly, remember that it is extremely carcinogenic and has been linked to hepatocellular carcinoma. The second species in toxin are Aspergillus fumigatus and Galeotoxin, which share a G in their name, unlike Aflavus and Aflatoxin. Also associated with peanuts and crops, but not linked to hepatocellular carcinoma. Most importantly, the morphology. Aspergillus has true septated hyphae that branch at acute angles or 45 degrees. You can remember acute angles because A shares the A in Aspergillus. Finally, he is catalase positive, which we will always represent with our cat in lace. And now onto the pathologies, collectively termed aspergillosis. There are three we will go over, ordered from least to most severe. The first one is ABPA, sorry for that typo, which is a type one and three hypersensitivity seen in patients with asthma or cystic fibrosis. It will present as an episode with wheezing, dyspnea, productive cough, and fever. The pathogenesis is the same as it is for asthma or CF with repeated episodes of obstruction, inflammation, and mucoid impaction, this time due to colonization of A. fumigatus. The gold standard for diagnosis is a cutaneous hyperreactivity to an aspergillus antigen because the patient may or may not have elevated IgE. On bronchial alveolar lavage, you will see the same as you would in asthma or CF, but you will appreciate the hyphae of aspergillus. On chest x-ray, you may appreciate central bronchiectasis or transient pulmonary infiltrates. Next up is the fungal ball or aspergilloma, as you can see there on the girl's image. This occurs when A. fumigatus is able to colonize a pre-existing cavity in the lung typically due to a prior TB infection, but also could be from Klebsiella or Coccidioides. The presentation is typically a productive cough with wheezing, and they may or may not have hemoptysis. The diagnosis will be on physical exam or in CT, and don't forget these fungal balls will be gravity dependent. As you can see in that image, the ball has fallen to the posterior aspect of that cavity. And last and final is invasive aspergillosis. Now it is angioinvasive because its tropism is to the blood vessel. And this is going to occur in your patients who are most severely immune compromised, especially patients with CGD. Because remember, aspergillus is catalase positive. The pathogenesis is that it invades the blood vessel wall, leading to thrombosis and coagulative or liquefactive necrosis, because the two most common places this occurs is in the lung and the brain, causing either necrotizing pneumonia or stroke, respectively. On chest x-ray or CT, you will see a halo sign, also called an air crescent sign, which is the opacity around that central lesion. And on C for the CNS on CT, you will see a ring enhancing lesion. Other pathologies are fungal myocarditis and renal failure. And the last thing to know about invasive aspergillosis is that it can cause paranasal sinus um, invasion 
leading to necrosis, which is important to remember because mucor also does this. In general, the blood work, you may see eosinophilia, especially in ABPA, with elevated IgE, with or without IgG, and IgE specific to aspergillus. Treatment options are always the same for these, which is azoles for localized infections and IV amphotericin B for systemic infections. So to wrap up the main points, remember ABPA in asthmatic patients, fungal balls in a pre-existing cavity, and invasive aspergillosis leading to necrotizing pneumonia or stroke. And as always, remember the morphology is probably the most importantly tested topic, which is true septated hyphae that branch at acute angles or 45 degrees. Up next is mucor mycosis, which is any disease caused by fungi in the order mucoralis, which are our bread molds. For our purposes, we need to know mucor and rhizophus. The route of entry is through inhalation of these spores or sporangia. These are all widespread worldwide. And this one's tropism is also to the blood vessels, just like aspergillus. However, on morphology, you will see irregular, broad, non-septate hyphae that branch at wide or right angles, AKA 90 degrees. Now our risk factors, the first one to keep in mind is type one diabetics in ketoacidosis. The low pH and high glucose levels provides the perfect environment for mucor to take over. The second, which is always true, is HIV AIDS and neutropenia. The trick I used to use to remember this was the clock at three o'clock. The first thing to remember is that your type one diabetics in DKA are at most risk. Second one is your HIV AIDS patients or neutropenics. And then at three o'clock, the clock hands are at a right angle to remember the morphology as wide right angle branching. And now for the pathology, the pathogenesis starts off with inhalation of the spores, after which it's able to invade the endothelial cells of our blood vessels, leading to thrombosis and ischemia. Think of this one as wherever it touches, it necrosis. This of course can occur in the lung, leading to diffuse necrosis and consolidation, usually seen in the lower lobes. However, the more common presentation is in the CNS. Mucor can gain access to the CNS via the cribriform plate. The only other pathogen that we know of that can do this is Nigleria fowleri, who I will cover in my lecture on amoebas. Mucor most commonly infarcts the cerebellum and the frontal lobes. This, of course, will be a red infarct, which is one of the few pathologies in the cerebellum where you will have a red infarct. And just as a reminder, for 24 hours after an infarct, it will be red in the brain. Then it will become liquefactive necrosis and ultimately gliosis after two weeks. And lastly, of course, this can also cause cavernous sinus thrombosis. The clinical presentation in the lung, as always, fever, cough, and hemoptysis. So diagnosis will be on chest x-ray slash endoscopy, where you will see hilar lesions of the blood vessels that will bleed on touching. Note the images on the right. And the more common presentation is in the CNS, which starts off with progressive eye swelling and then quickly turns into facial and palatal necrosis with a serosanguinous black discharge from the nose, as well as unilateral headache. Now, if the cavernous sinus is involved, you can see cranial nerve pathologies in cranial nerves 3, 4, V2, V1 and V2 of trigeminal and abducens. Now, to confirm this diagnosis would be on tissue biopsy, where you, of course, would see the morphology of mucor, which is wide, right angle branching, and the sept there are no septated hyphae. Now, because mucor can spread so quickly to the CNS, the first-line drug is usually IV amphotericin B. Now, to wrap up the key points, remember non-septated hyphae that branch at wide right angles. The person could have a past medical history of type 1 diabetes, and the black discharge from the nose is what will distinguish this from an aspergillus pathology. Okay, so let's do some compare and contrast because it's super important to keep these two straight in terms of their morphologies. So for aspergillus and then mucor slash rhizophus, AS, aspergillus has the septated hyphae. M and N, mucor has the non-septated hyphae. Also, you can remember the A for acute angle branching for the A in aspergillus, leaving mucor and rhizophus the one with broad or wide angle branching. Likewise, 45 degrees comes before 90 degrees, just like A comes before M and N. Next up is Pneumocystis girovecchii. Now, some people say girovecchi, life choices, pick whichever one you want. As far as the etiology, he's a yeast-like fungus previously thought to be a protozoan until he was recategorized. He cannot be grown in culture and, of course, is found worldwide just like the rest of these. Most people are exposed in infancy, and there's actually some debate as to whether the disease is primary or due to reactivation. His specific inhaled form is not known, and his specific life cycle stages are not known, which is just less for us to have to know. And finally, his tropism is for the lung septae. He's primarily a respiratory pathogen. 
Morphologically, main thing to remember, he has no ergosterol in his cell wall. This is unlike any other fungus that we will learn, and it also means that he has an inherent resistance to our first-line antifungals. Now he has thick-walled globular cysts, which form in vivo and contain his spore forms, which are released upon rupture of the cyst wall. These cysts often collapse, forming a disc or cup-like shape, and the other word used to describe it sometimes is a ping-pong ball, and the diagnostic gold standard is the silver stain. As far as risk, risk factors, the main one to remember, of course, is HIV or AIDS because the CD4 T cell count needs to drop below 200 in order for a patient to be at risk. This is our first AIDS-defining illness on our list, and it's the most common cause of pneumonia in AIDS patients, and it was actually the leading cause of death for HIV and AIDS patients in the late 80s and early 90s. The one and only pathology we need to know for him is PCP pneumonia. This starts with invasion of the alveolar septae, which causes type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes to over-replicate. This leads to thickening of the septae, as well as a thick edematous fluid to fill the septal spaces. As far as clinical presentations, it does have a subacute form, which can be silent, even with a normal chest exam on PE. However, more commonly, it presents as atypical interstitial pneumonia, with fever, dyspnea on exertion, and a dry cough. Remember, a dry cough. The patient may also present with doorstop cough, which means when you ask them to take a deep breath, they can't do that without coughing. In more severe cases, the patient may even present with a respiratory failure due to a VQ mismatch. This occurs because of the low O2 diffusion across these thickened, gunky alveolar septae. Refractory hypoxemia will also occur, which means providing O2 will not help. An important complication is presenting with a pneumothorax, so of course, chest pain, shortness of breath, with or without cyanosis, we will always hear decreased breath sounds on the affected side. Point to remember is that in an HIV or AIDS patient presenting with a pneumothorax, it is PCP pneumonia until proven otherwise. For diagnosis, the gold standard is bronchialveolar lavage stained with methylamine silver. And you will of course see the disc or cup-shaped cysts, also sometimes referred to as ping pong. Now for step, they love to test on biopsy, for which you will use an H&E stain, and they call it a cotton candy or a hyper eosinophilic appearance. This is, of course, highlighting that thick exudate in the septal spaces, and that mucus is so thick, that is why the person presents with a dry cough. It's that thick that they can't cough it up. On chest x-ray, you will see bilateral ground glass opacities, which is nonspecific for PCP. And then, of course, you can observe a pneumothorax, and in up to 50% of patients, they may even have a normal chest x-ray. Treatment options, very important to note because remember, we can't use our first-line antifungals. So to start off with prophylaxis, you would start prophylaxis if the CD4 T cell count drops below 200 or if the patient presents with another AIDS-defining illness. The drug of choice for prophylaxis is TMP-SMX with pentamidine, dapsone, or etovaquone in a patient that is allergic to sulfa drugs. The treatment, again, TMP-SMX, by mouth for mild cases and IV in severe cases. So to wrap up the main points, remember that dry cough, more severe respiratory failure with refractory hypoxemia or pneumothorax. Bronchioalveolar lavage is the gold standard and remember silver stain. On biopsy with H&E, you will see that cotton candy-like appearance. And finally, remember if a patient's CD4 T cell count drops below 200, you start prophylaxis with TMP SMX. Next up is Candida albicans, who's our big exception in all ways, starting off with the etiology. She has a commensal flora of our mucosa, giving her an inherent tropism. We all know she usually causes superficial infections like oral thrush, diaper rash, vaginitis, but in this lecture, I will be only covering when she becomes opportunistic. Morphologically, first aid describes her as dimorphic. Anywhere else you read, they will call her polymorphic. So on skin scraping, treated with KOH, aka a wet prep at 20 degrees, you will see budding yeast with pseudohyphae. That's the buzzword, budding yeast with pseudohyphae. The gold standard is the germ tube test which will show forming germ tubes when cultured in serum at 37 degrees C. Now, germ tubes are just the beginning of formation of hyphae. As far as cultures, those are usually never gold standard. Saberars agar can be used for any fungi, and some texts also reference cornmeal agar. For virulence factors, of which she has many, she forms a thick biofilm, meaning you have your risk of contamination for things that are like inborn catheters, prosthesis, also making her a nosocomial disease. Now, hypho formation actually is what allows for tissue penetration and escaping phagocytosis. She is a siderophore, which means she has the machinery capable of acquiring iron from the host. And she's the second one on our list that is catalase positive, which we will always represent with our cat in lace. And catalase positive microbes also means that patients with chronic granulomatous disease are more at risk. Onto the risk factors, 
specifically for her to become opportunistic. The first one is HIV AIDS with a CD4 T cell count below 400 for oral thrush. Secondly, in HIV AIDS patients whose CD4 T cell counts are below 100, they are at risk for candidal esophagitis, which is an AIDS, our second AIDS-defining illness on our list. And lastly, she can disseminate to any and all organs forming microabscesses. For pathologies, we will always run from least to most severe. Starting off with oral thrush, patients at risk are asthmatics due to corticosteroid inhaler use. Always tell those patients to rinse their mouth out after each use to lower the risk. Bottle-fed babies are also at risk because they're technically immune deficient as they haven't fully developed it yet. Finally, of course, are patients with HIV or AIDS whose CD4 T cell count is below 400. Clinically, it will present as a white superficial pseudomembrane that is easily scraped off. This distinguishes it from leukoplakia, who usually presents on the lateral aspect of the tongue and will bleed on scraping. Now, the actual film itself contains debris, fibrin, as well as desquamated epithelia. Next is candidal esophagitis. Who is at risk are AIDS patients whose CD4 T cell count is below 100. Clinically, they will present with odinophagia, which is pain on swallowing, dysphagia, which is just difficulty swallowing, as well as retrosternal pain. Diagnosis is on endoscopy. Note the picture on the right. You can see the co uh, colonies of candida growing in linear lines. Finally, we have systemic candidiasis, also called candidemia. Those at risk are HIV AIDS, same as before, CD4 below 100. It can also occur through direct inoculation, such as the case with IV drug users. Also at risk are premature neonates and neutropenic patients. For IV drug users, it can cause infective endocarditis with a 50% mortality rate. This, of course, will be right-sided as drug users inject into the veins and will present with fever, chills, that new murmur, and malaise. And of course, will be non-responsive to antibiotics. If you have an IE case non-responsive to antibiotics, assume candida. In the CNS, it mainly presents in premature neonates, which happens during birth. And the only observable signs will be high fever and meningeal signs. And finally, it can cause septicemia and disseminate to any and all organs. As you can see in the photo, it causes microabscesses systemically. Now for treatments, oral and esophageal can be treated with nystatin mouthwash form. Remember, nystatin is never IV, so swish and spit, or you can use fluconazole orally. Systemically, of course, IV infiltericin B with or without flucytosine, and caspofungin can be used if the patient is non-responsive. On to the high yield points. Remember, the morphology is budding yeast with pseudohyphae at 20 degrees, and it forms germ tubes at 37 degrees. The three pathologies are oral thrush for asthmatics, bottle-fed babies, and CD4 T cell counts below 400, esophagitis, which is an AIDS-defining illness, and then finally, infective endocarditis in an IV drug user. Treatments orally with my statin, swish and spit, fluconazole by mouth, and for systemic forms, use IV amphotericin B or caspofungin. And finally, we've made it to the end with Cryptococcus neoformans. His etiology begins with inhalation of the basidiospores, which are found in the feces of pigeons and birds. His tropism is for the meninges, and morphologically, this is the only encapsulated yeast tested. So he's got a thick polysaccharide capsule that's synthesized upon inhalation, and as with any capsule, it inhibits phagocytosis. For diagnosis, the gold standard is India ink stain applied to a sample of CSF. The thick capsule does not allow for absorption of the stain, so this is referred to as negative staining. In tissue samples, the gold standard is mucic carmine stain, which is that image on the far right which is absorbed by the capsule. On culture, of course, we can use Saberar's agar, which takes weeks, but I have seen some sample questions because they refer to it as narrow budding. And the last few points, his cell wall contains melanin, and he is urease positive. And I have read that his virulence includes the ability to survive inside of macrophages. The risk factor, one and only, HIV AIDS with CD4 T cell counts dropping below 100. For completion's sake, patients that have Hodgkin's lymphoma, sarcoidosis, cirrhosis, or long-term corticosteroid use are technically at risk, but the CD4 T cell count needs to be below 100. This is our third and last AIDS-defining illness, and it is the most common cause of fungal meningitis. And finally, for toriolosis, the pathogenesis begins with the inhalation of the unencapsulated yeast, so his basidiospores. That triggers synthesis of his capsule by GXM. Now, the inflammatory reaction will be absent, not only because the patient has AIDS, but also because his capsule is inert. Once inhaled, he spreads via the blood to the meninges, where he begins to replicate wildly. And the damage is due to sheer numbers, meaning pressure lesions. Now, these lesions can compress the choroid plexus, leading to cerebral edema or hydrocephalus. And it can also compress a blood vessel, leading to ischemia and infarction. 
For a clinical presentation, for completion's sake, I included respiratory, which is, of course, atypical pneumonia, but most commonly, it will present as cryptococcal meningitis. Now, you will not see fever or neck stiffness because those are inflammatory symptoms. However, the person will, of course, have a headache, increased ICP, projectile vomiting, and photophobia. Diagnostically, to go over again, for a tissue sample, you use mucicarmine stain, and you will observe the organism in the perivascular space. On CT, MRI, or on gross postmortem, you will see cystic spaces containing soap bubble lesions in the gray matter. CSF is obviously the gold standard. If I ask for the levels, glucose is normal or reduced, and protein is very high. India ink stain, they will appear as a clear halo. Again, this is negative staining. And finally, latex agglutination, aka wheel felix, which uses the polysaccharide antigen. Treatments, can you guess? Locally, use fluconazole. Systemically, which is the most common, obviously, use IV amphotericin B plus flucytosine for two weeks, followed by oral fluconazole for 10 weeks. And to wrap up the high yield points, again, CD4 T cell counts below 100. This is the only encapsulated fungus and mainly affects the CNS with no inflammatory symptoms. On bowel or CSF sample, we use India ink stain and wheel Felix test. And on biopsy, you use mucic carmine stain. Treatment, IV amphotericin B plus fucytosine, followed by fluconazole. Oof, okay, doctor. I know that was a lot, but you finally made it to the end of these opportunists. I really hope you found this video helpful. If you did, make sure you smash that huge thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I'll leave some other helpful videos linked at the end. Good luck studying, and I, of course, will see you on the next one. I just had to let you know you're fine.